Four games into the season. But what have we learned? Part one of two about the star Tumari Tiosari's reign at Chelsea Football Club. Are his system and ideas working? How have all the individual players been performing? What can we achieve this season? Are Chelsea serious title contenders? To find out about all of that and more in detail, make sure you watch all of this video plus tomorrow's part two. Hello there guys and welcome back to 100% Chelsea 4, basically a one-off video because it's the international break and there's no reviews and previews to be made at the moment. So, you know, I kind of thought, hmm, before games into the season, what have we actually learned? Let's talk about it, let's look at it in detail. And also, like I said, it's the international break, there's not much to talk about except Thibaut Courtois, in all honesty. If you haven't seen that video that Louis and Jack made about him, make sure you check it out. So like I said in the intro, this is part one of two, and the part two will be uploaded tomorrow, basically. So, um, you know, make sure you subscribe to 100% Chelsea, and also click the notification bell button, and choose to be notified about all uploads, so you actually, you know, get a notification when that video is uploaded, and of course, all the future videos that will be uploaded as well, about games, reviews, previews, fan camps, all sorts. If you don't want to miss out on that, like I said, do subscribe and also let's see whether we're going to get 700 likes in this video. I would massively appreciate that. We would all massively appreciate that. So that'd be absolute class. So make sure you smash that like button down below. But now actually getting into the video. And like I said, let's take a look at our first four games and see what we've really learned about our team, about Maurizio Sarri, about his system and our changes going forward this season. Before going into detail, let me clarify that I do realise that three of our four opponents have been Huddersfield, Newcastle and Bournemouth and not the most, you know, difficult teams out there. But saying that, last season we dropped points against all of those teams. We got a one all draw at Huddersfield, uh, with Huddersfield at home late, late last season and both Newcastle and Bournemouth smacked us 3-0 once last season. Bournemouth at the bridge in January and Newcastle at St James's Park on the last day of the season. So really, even the games we had weren't easy. So yes, you can maybe say that Newcastle aren't as good this season so far as they were last season. And yes, it is late into the season, so Huddersfield maybe aren't you know, fighting as hard to avoid relegation. But, you know, we beat them nonetheless. And last season, we couldn't beat them on one occasion each for all of those three teams. And, of course, we also played Arsenal, who, yes, are in transitional period after changing managers for the first time in 22 years. But still, they bought well this summer, I thought. And philosophy and system-wise, they aren't going through anywhere near as much of a drastic change as we are. Yet, we still beat them. So with all of that in mind, and also considering that except Arsenal, none of the top six have faced more than one other team in the top six, Liverpool facing none by the way, I think you can certainly judge the start to the season fairly evenly between the top six at least. So as we speak right now, the top of the league table basically looks like this. Four wins from four for Liverpool, ourselves Chelsea, and amazingly so, also Watford who beat Tottenham last weekend by two goals to one. Man City obviously just behind with their draw against Wolves, in which to be fair, Wolves were rather fortunate with the goal being a clear hand ball and City hitting the woodwork two or three times I think. Tottenham with their just mentioned defeat to Watford with Arsenal and United being down in 9th and 10th on just six points but that's how it's looking at the top of the table at the moment but that's enough about the other teams let's talk about Chelsea and so far we've scored 10 goals this season in the four games only Man City scoring more with 11. We've conceded three goals with which we're level with quite a few teams in the league but only beaten by Liverpool who've only conceded one so far but again they're the only ones of the top six that haven't faced anyone else in the top six, with the four games being against West Ham, who still are on zero points, against Palace, Brighton and also Leicester. So far we've managed to keep two clean sheets and face just 10 shots on target in all of the four games combined, which is the third best, you know, stat in the league, behind Watford and City who both faced just eight um, shots on their target, but ahead of Liverpool who faced 11 shots. Now of course we all know that one of the biggest changes changing from Antonio Conte to Mauricio Sarri will be the changes in possession. Against Huddersfield we had six 63% position, 62% versus Arsenal, 81% at Newcastle and 73% against Bournemouth last week. Now before talking about what we've learned overall, at least in my opinion, let's go through the team and starting with the goalkeeper. So as you know, only a few days before the start of the season did we buy Kepa Arita Balaga for around 80 million euros or 71 rather really 73 million pounds but for some reason it's always been reported that it's 71 million pounds from Adetic Bilbao after selling Thibaut Courtois to Real Madrid. Now, what did I make of Kepa in the first few games? Well, to be honest, I think he's done all right so far. Yes, he should have saved Arsenal's first goal against us because he did get a strong hand to it. And, um, you know, if you get that much of a strong hand to it, you should keep it out. And he had another small mistake in that game, but he recovered for that himself. So fair play. And in my opinion, there was nothing really that he could have done about the second goal that, you know, was scored in that game. 
no, you know, I will be shot from very close distance. No chance in hell Kepa can get to that because he's also just guessing on where he's gonna put it. It's just like waiting and trying to react, but no chance it's gonna that's ever gonna happen. And also, I don't think there was anything he could have done about the Newcastle goal. You know, the goal that Newcastle scored against us. Many people keep saying he shouldn't get beat at his near post, and generally, I do agree with that statement. But the ball went in right in the top corner, and it was headed from very close range as well at good pace as well. In my opinion, not a chance he can save that. Some people have then said that Corto would have saved it, and I mean, I don't personally think so, simply because it was hit from or headed from such close range and good pace but the only reason Corto might have saved it is because he's taller and therefore wouldn't have had to raise his arm or hand as high in such a short amount of time if you will but you can't really hold that against Kepa that he is shorter you know if we have an issue with that as a club we shouldn't have signed a short keeper if you will he's not short short but like a lot shorter than Corto because Corto is just massive but you kind of get the point I don't think you can blame him for that either overall he's made a few good saves as well but he hasn't really faced that many difficult shots except for the ones he's conceded and except the first one against Arsenal I don't really think he can be blamed for any of them his distribution the first two games I didn't really like, especially with how good it was in the Liga. But um, I thought against Newcastle and against Bournemouth, it has gotten a lot better already. And um, of course, you know, it takes time to get used to a different league, different surroundings. The only thing I can really criticise about him is that he doesn't come out to catch or punch cross balls enough, in my opinion. Whether that's from open play or mainly set pieces, doesn't matter, but he doesn't do it enough. And that was already his main or almost only flaw back in La Liga. And certainly has to do with his height, of course, because like I said, he's not as tall as Thibaut Courtois, for example. But has also to do with his age and being new to the league. The Premier League inside the box, especially for set pieces, is extremely physical. Kepa, not just height-wise, but overall, isn't exactly a huge guy. But um, I think that he still has to get used to the league as well and maybe bulk up a bit. And I think with time, he will be just fine. So overall, I am happy with him. I can see him improving massively over the years to come and becoming one of the best keepers in the world. And no, I'm not just saying that now that he's at Chelsea. But we have to give him time. And he might make a few mistakes this season, maybe even next season. But I urge everyone to be calm about it and keep supporting him if it does happen. Because remember David De Gea's first two seasons in the Premier League? I mean, he looked god bloody awful at times. I mean, some of the mistakes he made were ridiculous, basically. But look at him now being the best goalkeeper in the world. I'm not saying this necessarily was going to happen to Kepa, but I think he has the potential for similar things to happen to him. Um, but maybe he, hopefully, will be better at the start. But like I said, you know, goalkeepers can be poor to start things off with, coming from Spain to England. It's not easy. Like I said, look at the hair, but look at that turn down. So that's really about the goalkeepers because Caballero hasn't featured yet. So, um, you know, let's go straight to the defence. And of course, with the managerial change from Antonio Conte to Maurizio Sarri, we have also changed our formation from a 3-5 at the back system to Sarri's 4-3-3. So obviously four at the back. And that back four in all of our games so far has consisted of Azpilicueta at right back, Marcus Alonso at left back and Rüdiger and David Luiz at centre back. Now for me, Antonio Rüdiger has been our best defender so far. No mistakes that I can really think of improving more and more on the ball. Very good tackles, good in the air, outstanding pace, you know, and it's always an advantage to us and he certainly has a lot, a lot of pace. And although he still has some moments of madness where he completely forgets about positioning and just runs after the ball like a crazy person, he's certainly been very good so far this season, I think. And next, I basically put Athby and Alonso on one step because Asby has lacked quite a bit going forward, although it was better against Bournemouth but has done very well defensively, as he always does, because he's one of the best defenders in the league, if not in the world. And um, even though I've criticised it myself already, this season, that he doesn't bomb forward enough and he doesn't do enough attacking work, I do want to make it clear that also at Napoli, Maritio Sarri's right back was a lot less attacking than his left back. Husai, forgot his first name, was a lot less attacking than Gulan was on the left. So, you know, that's kind of what Sarri does. Against Newcastle, when we obviously needed a goal in the second half, I thought it was pretty obvious to see that Sarri told us to be the push fair of the pitch in the second half. And, you know, he had, I think, yeah, even had a decent shot on target, which, you know, didn't do perfectly well with, but he certainly pushed up more. And he did so for most of the game, even in the first half already against Bournemouth. Um, so it was better, and he did try to cross the ball a lot more against Bournemouth as well. So while I do think that Aspilicueta can and has to improve on that side of the game, it's also partly down to Sarri's instructions, and I don't think people should be as hard on him as they are. But yes, I do agree, sometimes he should push a bit further forward and maybe not take the cautious pass all the time. But, you know, yes, I know he's naturally a right back, but think back to how long it's been since Aspilicueta has actually, you know, consistently played a right back. That was 
back in 2013, and back then he wasn't even a starter at Chelsea. So I'm um, basically back to his Marseille days. You have to go is when he properly played as a right back regularly, because you know, yes, I know Rafa he played a little bit, um, but and under Di Matteo, I'm not quite sure. Did he play under Di Matteo or was that Ivanovic? I think under Di Matteo he didn't really play, but under Rafa and Benitez obviously he did. And then when Mourinho came, he was on the bench first, and then replaced Ashley Cole at left back, and then under Conte he played as the right centre back. So he hasn't played at right back in so many years. So it's basically his first four games at right back, you know, if you don't include preseason, in five or six years. So, you know, you've got to give the guy time and also he will improve massively, I think. And the Lons on the other side is basically the complete opposite. Not proving me wrong at all so far um, about his lack of pace harming us in defensive situations, but especially when we're being hit on account and he's basically by the opposition's box, he just doesn't have the pace to run back in time. Going forward though, he's been absolutely incredible. One of our most influential players of the season so far, winning the penalties both at Huddersfield and at Newcastle, although the Newcastle one is a little bit debatable, still won it, assisting three goals already, if you do count um, the shot that led to led Yedlin's own goal at Newcastle as an assist, and scoring the winner against Arsenal as well. And some people even like to see winning a then converted penalty as an assist, so that would make it five assists for Alonso already, but at least it's five goals of our 10 that we've scored in the league, he's played a very big role in. So you can't deny Marcus Alonso's huge role so far this season, even though I do stand by it that, um, you know, his lack of pace still harms us in some, you know, situations defensively. Maritio Sarri went out there after the last game against Bournemouth and said he's one of the best defenders, left-backs in Europe. And, you know, if he improves defensively, he could be the best left-back in the world. Not quite sure about that, but, you know, I hope to be proved wrong. If that happens, great. But um, I'm not sure he can improve that much when he's already 27. But, you know, we'll have to wait and see. But now coming to the fourth best, you know, defender of our back four so far, and I intentionally said fourth best rather than worst. And obviously there has to be David Luiz because all the other three have been mentioned so far. And to be honest, I thought he started the season well. I thought he had a decent game at Huddersfield. I really didn't understand, um, you know, most of the criticism for his performance against Arsenal because I thought he did quite well, no better or worse than Rüdiger did in that game, in my opinion. But against Newcastle, he was clearly at fault for that goal we conceded by just watching rather than attacking the ball to not let Jose Duan get there first and head it in. And then against Bournemouth last week, well, he made one or two really big mistakes. You know, the biggest one being when you let Callum Wilson just run in behind him into the box and, you know, he didn't even notice he was there and he just was just jogging along and, you know, basically Callum Wilson ended up in the box with a huge chance of a volley that he thankfully put over, but... David Luiz was just completely asleep and didn't even realise what was happening and you can't be making mistakes like that. He also misplaced the pass which led to a good chance for Bournemouth which Kante intercepted incredibly well and that can happen, you know, these passes. But to not realise someone's running in behind you, that cannot happen. And of course, that situation sparked the whole debate about Christensen starting over Luiz even more. And a lot of people are saying Luiz makes too many mistakes that his ability on the ball doesn't make up for it. And I'm going to be boring... And I'll say that I'll leave it down to Maritio Sarri to decide on who out of them two will start. Because simply, we haven't seen Christensen play under Sarri. So it's difficult to judge if he'd be better or not. Yes, it, you know, fair enough. Try it out. I, I agree with that. But us as fans, we've only seen his ability really in competitive games in a back three or back five. In which, by the way, Luis has also played very well, especially in Conte's first season. I mean, if you haven't watched Christensen on his loan at Borussia Mönchengladbach, you haven't basically ever seen Christensen play in the back four. Because even for Denmark, he, at the World Cup, sometimes played as the CDM. Or, you know, usually they play in the back three, although I don't think they quite did at the World Cup. But even still, he played in the back three at Denmark more than in the back four as well, if I'm not mistaken. So, it's always easy to say someone that hasn't played would do better than the guy that is playing, but has made mistakes. But it doesn't always work out like that. I'm not saying Christensen can't be, or definitely isn't better than David Luiz, but Sarri must have his reasons for sticking with Luiz for now. I mean, we, you know, I said, you know, try it out, play him, but at the same time, Sarri sees them in training every day. So, surely there has to be a reason. Yes, you know, I've criticised Conte and other managers just as much in the past, and I'm like, what are you doing kind of thing? And, you know, you could say the same about Sari right now, fair enough. But we haven't seen Christensen under Sari. So how can we judge? Sari sees him in training, so surely he can judge better than we can. You know, of course, I could be wrong, and this is just my opinion. Please don't murder me. Um, but yeah, you know, that's just what I'm saying. But also don't forget that after this international break, we're basically going to be playing every three days from now until Christmas, or until January even. Um, so especially if we continue, you know, if we go through in the League Cup, so Christensen and other players will get plenty of chances and game time. And if they perform better than their counterparts in that position, they might get to start in the main first 11. We'll have to wait and see. 
But, um, you know, I think some of the criticism for Luis at the start of the season was unwarranted. In the last two games, there certainly have been some big mistakes. And obviously in defence, we also have the likes of David Zapacosta, Gary Cahill, Ampadu and Emerson. But none of those really have featured so far at all. So um, at the moment, I don't really see why there's, there's not much to say about them. And I don't see why and how Aspi, Rüdiger and Alonso should and could be dropped. But of course, like I said, there is this debate about Christensen and David Luiz. But yeah, that's really about the first part of this video. About what we've learned in the first game under Maurizio Sarri. Tomorrow afternoon or in the evening, we'll see when it goes up. I will speak about the midfields. I will speak about the attackers and I will basically give an overall roundup what I think it's been like on Amaritia Sari, how it's been working, what we can expect to improve, what has to improve that I don't necessarily see improving and also what I think that Chelsea can achieve this season and whether we are actually title contenders. So, um, you know, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe um, to 100% Chelsea to not miss that video tomorrow because, you know, there's no point watching this if you're not going to watch it tomorrow. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you have any thoughts on this video so far, leave me all of your thoughts down in the comments section below on, you know, basically everything I've mentioned. If you disagree, if you agree, let me know down in the comments section below. Like I said in the beginning as well, let's see whether we can hit 700 likes on this video. I would massively appreciate it. And of course, don't forget to check out my social media. Links are in the description and you can see it over here, last 15 or 7 on both Instagram and Twitter. But yeah, that's really it for me. I'll see you in part two of this basically video. To tomorrow but yeah until then up the chills and i'll see you next time